Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and welcome to Interior Design, The New Freedom. Today we'll be talking to Mark Hampton, who's had a most unusual preparation for his career. He studied history, economics, and law until he changed direction and became an interior designer. Mark, how important was that early training to the work that you're doing now? I think it was uh, probably not that important, really. Then why'd you do it? Oh, I think... Um I, it seemed too unconventional to become an interior decorator. Uh, there was no place, to, I mean, Indiana, no place to be trained for it, uh, no place to go to work doing it. And until I really got a job, um, it seemed ephemeral kind of a career to strike out on. Well, here you were living in Plainfield, Indiana, population 3,000 at the time, reading House and Home magazine. Had you ever managed to get a copy? Well, I was given a subscription to uh, that by some wonderful elderly people who built a very modern house in Plainfield when I was 10 years old. And I just hung around the building site all the time watching this house. It was the only modern house in town. And they turned out to be great for lovers of Frank Lloyd Wright and of Meese. Um, that was in 1950. The Farnsworth House came out in that magazine in 1951 when I was 11. And they gave me a subscription of that magazine. It was, you know, my great treasure. And Frank Lloyd Wright and Meese were the very models of architecture that you were interested in? Well, I always liked lots of different things, you know. Even now, I like all different styles. Um, I loved Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, but then I loved old houses. I had an art teacher in the fourth grade who taught me the difference between Victorian houses and Georgian houses, and then the difference between a Georgian house and a Greek revival house. You see, I thought that was wonderful, and I loved drawing all kinds of houses. I never really settled onto one style. And would you say that would characterize your work now? Is there a particular signature that you have? Uh, I would hope it would characterize my work. You know, it's almost impossible not to get into some kind of um, a pattern of work because people do come to you uh, having seen something you've done, uh, whether in person or in photographs, and frequently say that they like this room. How can you turn this room into a, into a room for them? Well, that must be very discouraging to a designer in the sense that it's flattering that one comes to you because they've seen your last job, but I guess you always want to go on to your next job. Yes, I, th I think the thing that's discouraging is to work with a personality that has no sense of confidence, no sense of a personal point of view, and no real taste, as it turns out. I mean, there are people, you know, who will look at a picture and they'll want that picture, but they have no, no real sense of their own taste. What is good taste? Well, good taste, I think... Um, is certainly not definable in, in short sentences. I think you've got to look back um, at what, what periods of taste have survived. And I suppose there's where I'm very timid about uh, making predictions about present taste. You know? I think you can look back and see the great designs. Uh, even now, we can look back at the great modern designs of the 20s and 30s and see what still looks great and what doesn't look great. You have to trust yourself. I mean, I don't think that you can be a decorator if you don't have some awful vanity about your own taste. Uh, and that's strengthened by people's opinions of you, by your, your opinion of yourself, by your success. Uh, but I do think that there are a lot of things that it's simply too late to say, you know, the Louis XVI chair is bad taste, or the Barcelona chair is bad taste, or the Queen Anne chair is bad taste. We know that these things have passed all possible tests. Well, you've had three excellent finishing schools in addition to your own training. And I'm thinking of the work that you've done with David Hicks and Macmillan and Sister Parrish. To begin with, how did you land your first job with David Hicks? That was quite a coup for a first job. I was an undergraduate at the London School of Economics, and I had, in my spring term, very few courses, uh, one tutorial. And I drew all the time, as I do now. And I took a portfolio of drawings into, you know, to interview for a job. And he needed someone a month later. He was losing his assistant in a month and asked me to come back in four weeks, which I did, and worked there for about two months, almost three months, mostly doing drawings. I wanted to go into decorating, and my parents thought it was a terrible idea, so I went back, finished my undergraduate work, did a year of law school, um, and then went into art history uh, as a kind of a... Uh, compromise, I guess. It sounded more serious to my parents than decorating. There wasn't always such a thing as interior design. In fact, uh, when you talk about those rooms of the 30s, there aren't many great 
great grandmothers around who even had interior design, certainly not interior designers, or interior decorators. How old is the profession? Well, I think it had, it, it really began, I think, in the 18th century. Then it sort of disappeared. It became the work of upholstering companies. Um, you, I mean, you know, 18th century French and English rooms were certainly decorated. But, but the by furniture, cabinet makers as well. Or by architects, yeah. you see. I mean, you have that incredible phenomenon in England of Robert Adam designing furniture and Thomas Chippendale making it, or else Tom and Chippendale, Thomas Chippendale making the furniture that he designed. But these men designed curtains, they designed moldings, ceilings, carpets, chairs. Um, you know, that's that room up at the Met, the Croom Court tapestry room. Everything in it is designed by Robert Adam, the fireplace. Mm -hmm. So that is interior decoration, certainly closely uh, linked to the architecture. Um, then I think in, uh, like a lot of things that have to do with taste, it has to do with the expanding economy, the rising middle classes, the parvenu. Um, you know, the new rich have had a huge impact on taste. Uh, there's where a lot of the overstatement comes in of our time. I think it's that lust for opulence. In the 19th century, the, all those huge houses that were built all over England uh, were finished up by those big upholstering companies in, uh, in, in England, in London. And then we yeah. come to the 20th century and what you refer to as the rise of the middle classes and I guess a more widespread affluence, mobility and education. Sure, sure. But I think you, what you'd really date it to is the magazines. I think it was the magazines that really, I think it was probably Condé Nast and House and Garden magazine in this country. Uh, that during the 30s started publishing. In those days, nobody said, I don't want to have my house published, if mm -hmm. you look at those old magazines. Um, I mean, the richest, chicest people would allow themselves to be photographed in their rooms, things that nobody will do nowadays except for, I don't know, women's wear. But um, uh, it's funny this, that, that people were very innocent about publicity. At least they, it wasn't considered the vulgarity for a lot of people that it is today. Um, and I think those magazines are what really marketed the idea of having a decorator. Now decorators do what architects used to do, back to what we were talking about in the 18th century, mm -hmm. and cabinet makers. The, uh, an interior decorator now really commonly um, rips everything out and puts it back a different way, in houses and in apartments. Certainly in apartments we do that all the time. How do you define what it is that you do? Well, I, it's very flexible. If somebody comes to me with a big project and wants to add a wing or tear down a room and make it bigger, um, I can do that and decorate it and um, work with a landscape architect and all that. I love doing that. If someone comes to me with a, a beautiful, say, a room with beautiful furniture and some good paintings and what they want is a good, um, just a good paint job and some new upholstery, I'll do that too. You see, I mean, what I do varies radically from one client to the next. And if someone has marvelous possessions, I love going in and, and just literally redecorating the room, not redesigning it. I think that there must be a particular kind of client that you would find ideal since you are so interested in art and antiques as contrasted, at least in their professional lives, to the work of a lot of other designers who I guess would prefer that... Uh, the client, if not rid themselves of all their possessions, certainly uh, many of them. What do you, kind of client do you prefer? Is it the collector that you're most interested in working with? I like people who, who have tastes that I find wonderful. I don't like a, a client that just uh, says yes, doesn't know the difference between a good idea and a bad idea. Do you know, I like clients that have beautiful possessions, want to get more, and certainly who do rely on me for um, improving the, the looks of their houses. But I like a certain intelligence. Well, is a job ever finished? Even the ones that you intend to finish? Well, good jobs, I think, uh, for, for people you love working for are never finished. Bad jobs are finished, I think, when the last bill is paid. Well, you must have had a client who you like working with very much, and I'm thinking of a very beautiful room that you decorated on Manhattan's Upper East Side. And you created a series of interiors in that apartment that are very much in the manner of an English country house. To begin with, do you think that period particularly lends itself to apartment living? Well, in New York it does because a lot of apartments are built in a sort of neo-Georgian taste. Um, there's another example, uh, Barbara Lee, of where fashion starts creeping into the whole concept of decorating. 
it's something that I find difficult to balance uh, cerebrally. I mean, you do like to be in style. You do not hire a decorator to be out of style, mm -hmm. or you do not hire someone who is happily out of style. You want to be in style. Um, so a lot of these uh, New York Georgian apartments were designed as American Georgian houses. But it's quite clear, I think, to anybody that uh, the fashion for a more English-looking um, apartment is a look that has become more fashionable now than, say, it was 25, 25 years, years ago. when it was French. Uh, when it was French, or else that very arid, sort of George III style, you know, gray walls, gray carpet, uh, Pembroke tables, wing chairs. In fact, you were talking about Williamsburg earlier. Williamsburg in the 50s had an enormous impact on taste, that sort of proper taste. And the apartment you're talking about started out not like a Williamsburg apartment because they only moved to it about seven years ago. But they moved from a house full of French furniture into this Georgian apartment. And we did it in a rather chaste Georgian way. White walls and um, a, a lot of chintz, but rather cool. However, in a rather unusual turn of events, you and the client decided to change the color of the room when it was all finished. What prompted that decision? Actually, it was her idea. It wasn't my idea. Um, was that she, one of the client's good ideas? Oh, yeah, it was a great idea. Uh, they lived in the apartment for about uh, two or three years with the white walls. And two things happened. Uh, it, it, I think, looked too cool to them, too disciplined. Um, and that, I think, is a, a great point in decorating. The longer you live in rooms, the more sure you are of the effect this room has on you, to say nothing of the effect you have on the room. This room obviously wasn't very severe, but very strict. Frequently, when you live in it for a long time, um, it starts loosening up around the edges. But you, you know, like a lived-in look. I love a lived-in look, but some rooms don't lend themselves to lived-in looks. Uh, I, I personally think that's one reason that modern, uh, you know, that beautiful, cool modern design of the Bauhaus mm -hmm. um, d can cannot appeal to an awful lot of people because it it simply demands that you put things away. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot uh, just drag things in all the time. And you have certainly never been very high on high tech. Never high on high tech. Although I've seen high tech rooms that are wonderful set pieces, you know. But they don't have much latitude, to me at any rate. They can't go very far. Mm -hmm. um, Too many you've fixed got to, elements. Yeah, you've got to put the paper away. You've got to, you know, you, you've got to put your book away. You've got to put a new, if someone gives you something, you have to put it away. I mean, we've all seen those rooms where there's no room for a Christmas gift. The kind of room that you prefer is filled with all kinds of comfortable furniture and personal memorabilia. But where do you draw the line between clutter and comfort? Well, first of all, I hate clutter that doesn't have any reason. I, you really you just, want organized yeah, clutter. Yeah, I mean, you know, people who buy shells all the time. I mean, you know, we could all own 80,000 shells. Why collect five of them, do you know? Um, so that I find very boring and very cheap looking. Um, I mean, if you collect wonderful shells that you find, fine. But just collecting junk because you feel that clutter is the look you want is something I dislike. It's sort of like, uh, you know, costume jewelry. Um, so that pointless, impersonal clutter I hate. But everyone can't afford Tiffany's. So. If you have uh, some sort of original taste, or at least nice taste, you can find things that you can afford that are pretty and that are personal. And that, of course, is the best kind of collection of objects, don't you think? Um, it's like people whose books are interesting to look at and whose tabletops are interesting. And they don't have to be covered with things, but pretty memorabilia, pretty objects. Um, but it's also a good reason to hire a decorator. I was once in Columbus, Ohio, and there I see this beautiful house, Mark Hampton. Texas, California, well, there's Yeah, a I love working out of town. Well, why, how do you manage to deal with craftsmen, or do you move everything in, sort of well, like the catered affair? You do move a lot in, sure. Um, an awful lot of the furniture, if, if I do a house out of town, I really hope, uh, I mean, I hate to sound like a, uh, prima donna, but I really insist on having the curtains and the furniture made here, and obviously the carpets have to come from here. Um, and that is a big undertaking. Uh, I have had to fly painters around, too. There are no painters in Texas? Well, no, I don't have to. I, I, there are some places where there isn't somebody to do the, the final fancy surface. Um, yeah. But it must be a very big job, because with all the demands on your time, you've it's quite true, you've only been in business for five years, but uh, obviously you have a very successful practice. 
and there is only one Mark Hampton, and there are only 24 hours in a day, and how many clients can you deal with at any one given time, let mm. alone clients out of town? That is a big problem. Well, out of town clients, of course, aren't calling you every day, and they're not sort of saying, get over here, you've got to see what's just happened, or, you know, there are two hooks out of the curtains, or... Uh, does that really happen oh, still? Oh, sure it does. Of course it does. Well, that sounds like, you know, a good part of your time, in addition to being a designer and a decorator, is, I guess, uh, analyst and parent. And in the furniture repair service, too, I think. I sometimes feel like I'm in the maintenance business, you know. Fixing chairs, fixing lampshades, replacing missing parts. I mean, you know, it's uh, endless. Well, that doesn't go on so much in a job that's a thousand miles away. You live with your wife, Duane, and your two daughters in Manhattan, in a rambling Park Avenue apartment that I think does reflect your love of space and of color. Perhaps you'd be good enough to tell us how it is that you live and why you chose to live in the fashion that you do. Well, in the first place, it has evolved a little bit. When I started out... How long um, have you lived in the apartment? Ten years. And before that, Duane and I lived in a very sort of middlingly modern apartment. And before that, we lived in a very strictly modern apartment. That's before we had any kids. And that was one of those places where you couldn't even have the paper out. <laughs> but I had just gone into business, and it had to be a bold statement. And so it was a very bold statement. And it was chic, and it got published a lot. So that in some ways, the residence of a designer is also a show place. That's an enormous it has burden. To be. Yeah, it is a burden. And that's the great thing that you have to resolve. But you do have to come to terms with what you can live with and what you can't. And you see how you entertain. Where do you put people for dinner? Well, how has your taste evolved in the very place in which you live? First of all, I fell out of love with plastic furniture. <laughs> as soon um, as you could afford better. Well, no, long before I could afford better, I'm sorry to say. Um, I mean, I've got a lot of furniture that's junk. Uh, there's where you really, it's back to what you're talking about, where you have to be very careful in the selection of your inexpensive furniture. Uh, no, we don't own great furniture, don't have anything really good. But we have some pretty furniture. Are there any elements that you've kept from the original design that are in the current oh, sure. design? Oh, gobs. Loads of elements. For example? Oh, I love marble and porphyry objects. They're all still there. The upholstered furniture's all still there. Uh, you know, you can change the arm on a chair, and you can change the trim on a pillow. Um, and the sofas I have, oh, we've had for 15 years, and they, you know, they're the same. They, they could look very modern or not. Well, in your... Its current incarnation, your, the living room of your apartment combines cotton print and English bustle-back chairs and a Chinese wedding chest and a Victorian desk. How did you manage to bring all of these diverse elements together and do it with such success? I think things do um, hold together if you select them, if you have um, some sort of taste. So that that, I mean, I have things, you understand, that are not in that room because they don't fit together. Uh, it's difficult to explain why things look well together. Do you know what I mean? The old thing of the uh, oh. French table with the Picasso on it and the pre-Columbian thing, we all know that those things look good together, but 80 years ago, nobody did it, right? Who makes the great leap well. forward and says, and suddenly, you know, I never thought of either d mixing those two periods or those two colors or those objects on that table. Are Who there are some of the great ones? Um, Cecil Beaton was one of the great ones. I don't know if you remember, but years ago, I think in the 40s, um, he did a famous suite at the Plaza or the St. Regis. I know he then later had a suite at the St. Regis. But anyway, he did one at the Plaza, I think was the first one, and there was a big leger over a big Louis XIV table and a Louis XV chandelier, and then all the furniture was sort of burgundy colored. It was a very snazzy room and very bold. I mean, mm -hmm. that terrific boldness is what changes other people's way of looking at things. Um, I guess and it's often the use of color and fabric that does that And as well. juxtaposition. Yes, the changing people's color taste is a very big stride. So we're um, in a period of eclecticism? I think we're in a period of great tolerance for new bold ideas or, or harking back to old bold ideas. I mean, the Victorian room that people talk about now or the Edwardian room is a very bold room, you understand. Is there Created anything currently rooms. that reflects that same kind of breakthrough in both taste and spirit? Um, or has it all been done? Well, oh no, high tech hadn't been done, and high tech did break through. But then I think, I think a lot of people finally you got there. There's no place to go. I mean, the room was dead on arrival, sort of. You know, there have always been people who've loved burgundy velvet and deep fringes and and pictures of uh, 
um, you know, exotica hanging all over the walls, 12 feet high. But what? it's now much more marketed. It's more, much more known. You know, it's, gonna, it's getting down to North Carolina and Grand Rapids and those people. And know. how will they translate that? Poorly, I suppose. Uh, Why don't we have any cheaply. great designers designing for mass furniture? Companies. I think, you know, it's a, a perhaps too simple an answer. I think just the whole thing of mass anything is defeating. I just think it spoils. I think it spoils it. I don't know whether it's because of people's um, greed for special things or their need for special attention, but I can't think of anything that is mass produced that finally can compete with something that isn't. How does the apartment that you live in and its design let your family live the way all of you want to? Um, I know that uh, your wife has a lot of training in interior design as well, so that obviously you don't create a forum without any response from an audience. Does she help make decisions well, in terms of your apartment? Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of her great axes that is constantly being ground <laughs> is that people say, oh, you know, do you ever get to do anything? Do you ever get to say this or that? Of course, she has enormous... Uh, foot that gets put down on ideas of mine all the time and I you know and I always tease her about the book stacks in the bedroom that get dusted like tables I mean these piles <laughs> of books that, that are sort That's of neat but they you know they're there they, they become permanent have you ever had a failure a job that you wouldn't oh, want to claim well no because I've always uh, and I, again I don't mean to sell, sell, sound self-congratulating but I've had rooms that I've had to fix sure well what did you fix in a room when you had a second I had to rip thought. up patterned carpets um, that have had people seeing double and just looked awful. I've had to repaint walls that turned out the wrong color. Um, I've simplified curtains that have been too elaborate. I mean, you know, these things happen. How does the client feel about those revisions? Oh, well, some of them must be very expensive. It, sometimes it ruins the relationship. Well, you, sometimes you take a bath on it. Sometimes people say, oh, well, it's not your fault. I approved it. Um, which is sort of like being patted on the head, but you are grateful for it when somebody says that. And frankly, I like working for people who do take some responsibility for making these decisions. I mean, um, you know, you don't go to a, a restaurant and order a meal and say, I don't like it, take it back. I mean, you do sometimes. Some people do, but I mean, you don't, I don't. You've got to take some responsibility. And that, of course, is the basis of the relationship between the decorator and his client. That trust. What is the ideal client? Oh, some good taste, uh, compatible personality, rich, um, and a sense of adventure. I mean, you said before that interior designers get better the more often they work and the, the more jobs they do. Good interior designers. <laughs> Let's assume that the good only improve. Yeah. But that need, need not necessarily be the case with furniture. In fact, I think if it was you who said that some furniture is ravaged by time rather than in enhanced by it. Sure, plastic tables. Um, those, I mean, I hate to use trade names, but those carved, square-looking sofas of the 50s um, that actually are quite comfortable but look very stiff and strict, and people don't like sitting on them and, you know, the little, funny little chrome legs. Um, I hate that kind of furniture. And, you know, I think another thing that that furniture has done, it's like what happened to Danish Modern. Everybody sort of got to Whatever thinking, happened to Danish well, Modern? Well, I think everybody finally identified it with motel furniture, and that was the end. I mean, out. <laughs> and an awful lot of modern furniture of the 50s, everybody had identified, except for the very rich again, who had the great pictures and the wonderful lacquer and all that, with offices. And people simply don't like, for the most part. Now, I mean, obviously, there are jillions of rooms that have wonderful, strict furniture. But for the most part, the public do not like furniture that reminds them of an office. On the contrary, I'm always working for men who want their offices to look like a room at home. I mean, you know, men who spend 12 hours a day in that room. What's the worst mistake that one can make in putting together a, a an environment? I think a slavish um, adherence to what we all call a look or a statement. Uh -huh. You know, we all talk about making a statement. I don't, but I'm constantly hearing about a statement. Does it make a statement, you know? Does what does that mean? Well, I mean, what indeed does it mean? We know, we see these rooms that have this big, this big but look. But every room makes bang. a statement, positively or negatively. But does that mean something that is I'm talking about degree. Pow? The big, loud, noisy, fashion-oriented statement. Does it look like an ad in women's wear? Does it look like an ad in, uh, uh, you know, Architectural Digest? And we 
that to me is bogus and, and poor. People who look silly in their clothes and people who look silly in their rooms. Uh, you know, people who serve funny food, you know, fad food, <laughs> fad flowers, fad hair. I mean, it goes on and on. What are it affects... fad flowers? Oh, wow. One single lily. <laughs> Do you remember the piece of driftwood and the, uh, and the chrysanthemum in 1956? Well, now, I mean, I wouldn't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but there are fad flowers. Tell us. Um, <laughs> Tell us what they flowers. are. Not your flowers. Not flowers. I don't think they're fad flowers. Um, oh, the, the fish bowl with something floating in it, you know. One, you know, <laughs> one flower floating. Hey, we've all seen it, haven't we? The votive lights flickering away on the table. I mean, there are all sorts of gimmicks, you know. Szechuan food, I think. This, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you consider to be the best of the American design tradition? I think... Um, there's a sort of a funny Protestantism about American design that's like so many things American. Uh, it is an absence of that European frightfully rich upper class look that is kind of gagging, I think. That's what I think of is, is the most wonderful thing about American art and design and so forth. That it has a nice throwaway quality and, and I hate to see that lost. And people, you know, decorators frequently are the agents of losing it too, I think. Uh, but I like the you know, the, 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 the little easier to take atmosphere that a lot of American rooms have. But you've also talked about that unique American phenomenon, and that is it's Americans who are obsessed with housekeeping. Won't you please expand what you mean by that phrase? I do love cleanliness. I do think that, you know, the longer you live in New York, the more seduced you are by the clean anything. Don't you think? If it's clean, you already like it better than something that isn't. How do you reflect this interest in order and organization and tidiness in a design? Do you see that as part of the function of design and designers? Facilitating sad, an existence? Sad sounding, isn't it? Probably is. Dreary, but it's probably, it probably is a function of designers. It's the gloomy side of design for people. Um, you know, the kind of nervous side. I do think that you have to help people avoid, and this is just very subjective on my part, avoid looking arbitrary. Do you know, what is it doing here? Why that chair? Why is this this color? Do you know, that mindless mixture of things, or that, um, which is not always necessarily ugly, but just that attempt at being different, just for the sake of being different. Do you know what I mean? Does that describe anything to you? I think it does, and thank you, Mark Hampton, for describing so much to us and in such a lively way, and as usual, it's been provocative and informative and just plain fun to talk to you. Thank and you. And thank you, audience, for being with us, too. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Interior Design, The New Freedom. Thank you. Good bravo.